and it was pretty clear to me that there was a gap in the conference market for this uh, information uh, that uh, would prove very valuable. So you were interested in what learning or, or kind of generating this conference just as a like a personal learning as well and then obviously to help other people along as well? Certainly, but I think primarily to be able to to uh, spread the word throughout the, the exploration community uh, about uh, the new discoveries that were being made uh, ultimately not only in Australia but throughout the world. That was Keith Yates. And hopefully this gives you some insight into how the New Gen Gold Conference came about. Find out more about the conference by going to their website, newgengold.com. I'm Ahmad, and this is Exploration Radio. This episode of the Exploration Radio podcast was made possible through sponsorship by the AIG, the Australian Institute of Geoscientists. To learn more about the AIG, the programs it supports, or to become a member, please go to aig.org.au. This episode of Exploration Radio is also sponsored by the Minerals Council of Australia. Find out why there's more to Australian mining and join the Friends of Australian Mining supporter network by visiting minerals.org.au. That's minerals.org.au. Hello, Wache. Um, bonjour. Je suis Charlie Angus, Deputy Federal de Timmins Bay James. I am here today to talk about the attack that has been launched against public institution in Ontario. The dismantlement of Laurentian University is an act of national vandalism of the likes of which we've never seen. For people to understand how important Laurentian is, you have to really understand the 60 years that went into building that institution. It is the only public institution in the country with a mandate to support Francophone, Indigenous and the working class Anglophone communities from the northern regions that never had access to education on the post-secondary level before. My father was a Laurentian graduate. He was never able to go to school because he was a son of a miner. He had to quit school at 16 and get a job. But Laurentian gave him an opportunity when he was an adult. He ended up becoming a, a professor of economics. That's not the only story. I know other people whose grandfathers worked at shifts at Inco and went to school at night and changed and became professionals. It is fair to say that geology and earth science programs have always been a niche discipline at universities. When you look at the number of students enrolling in these programs, they hardly ever make up a large part of the student body, especially when you compare it to other sciences like biology and chemistry. Now we have known about this problem for a long time. We've tried to do something about it, but to be honest, we've not made a lot of progress with this. In geology, we sometimes pride ourselves in being a niche science. The question I have is that if we continue to stay niche, then we are increasingly at risk of fading away when universities are pushed to the wall and society loses touch with what it is that we do and why we are important. The story of Laurentian University closing is a sad one, and there are many reasons why that happened. One reason suggested by many is the financial pressure that COVID has caused on universities. Globally, many universities have had to cancel programs and lay off staff and have also often canceled niche programs like geology and earth sciences. In Australia, a number of universities decided to stop their support for geology programs. As a country that relies a lot on mining, this seemed to be a short-sighted decision. COVID has undoubtedly accelerated the closure of many geology departments. But today, we are joined by Pete Betts from Monash University, who suggests some other reasons why geology programs are struggling to keep their place. Maybe it has more to do with the fact that we find it hard to engage the wider society with regards to why our science is important and what value it actually provides. My name is Ahmad, and this is Exploration Radio. Pete joined us on the line from Melbourne. Because of this, in places, the audio quality is not as great as it could be. We apologize for this. Pete Betts, welcome to Exploration Radio. Thanks, mate. Good to see you guys, and it's a pleasure to be here. Now, Pete, there's probably a lot of our audience that do know you, fortunately or unfortunately, but for those that don't, do you want to give us a brief intro on who you are, how you got to where you are? Uh, okay, yes, yeah, so I'm Pete Betts. I'm a professor of tectonics and structural geophysics at Monash. That's half my life. And I also have a role which has got a fancy title called the Associate Dean of Graduate Research, which basically means I manage the PhD program in the Faculty of Science. 
I started my life off as a, a structural geologist and I've merged and migrated across to applied geophysics and I do those two disciplines to apply to tectonic processes and and I'm also the president of the GSA at the moment. So that's been an interesting uh, experience. I've learned a lot more about governance than I ever thought I would ever have to. But yeah, so it's an opportunity to make a difference. And so I'm happy to be in that role. It's great. Yeah, cool. So the real reason behind, I guess, why we wanted to have on our show is lately you've been kind of on this road show. Yeah, I'll get you to kind of talk like, you know, the exact title. But, you know, I guess what this road show, what you're trying to do is raise the general awareness of geoscience education in this country and where we are and what the future looks like if we don't change in the way that we are kind of doing in the way that we are kind of putting out geoscience education so you want to talk a little bit about this roadshow you know what is it and what are you trying what's the message that you're trying to kind of get out yeah so the roadshow is really what i've been doing with the gsa prior to the role as the president and I was the traveling ambassador of the GSA and I was a really, a, I was given an opportunity to go and talk to all of the divisions in 2019, 2020. And of course, COVID put a, a massive stop to some of those uh, trips being in Victorian. That roadshow ended up being uh, tripped from my, around my bedroom, essentially, uh, and lots of Zoom talks. And I was given, a, I was allowed to talk whatever I wanted to talk about. And I think the, you know, everyone thought I was going to go and talk about my favorite research topic at the time and I and I and I've been coming more and more interested in in people and science and so what I decided to talk about is the narrative of of earth sciences and is that fit for purpose for 2021 and are there things that we do as geoscientists that are influencing the way we portray ourselves to society and then is that you know part of the um, challenge we have now with declining numbers etc so when I give it lots of people really engage with it but Sometimes people are quite challenged by it as well. So, you know, I'm not shirking the issue. I think it's a real challenge we've got to, to address. So. so it's interesting what you say. So you mentioned that your audience finds it a challenging topic. I mean, what's so challenging about it? Well, but the theme of it is, you know, our narrative in Australia is really tied to the minerals um, sector, so mining and exploration, and young people don't see that sector as something that's positive. They actually see it as, as, as something that is negative and, and, and they really see it as a dirty and extractive discipline and, and they don't make the link between that and the requirement for, you know, earth materials to mitigate some of the biggest challenges we have in society now, climate change, all the materials we basically make our medical instruments from, as an example, securing water, food, etc., all linked to earth sciences, and there's this massive disconnect. And, 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 and that disconnect is really linked to the way we, in some ways, celebrate in our own community the way we extract resources. And if I, you know, if I want to be brutally frank, it's like Steve Hill has this great analogy. It's like every time you go to a resources page, it, show, it doesn't show the rock and it doesn't show the product, it shows the mine. In farming, that's equivalent to showing the abattoir. And that would never be shown, right? So it's kind of really interesting to have those analogies. So my talk is really around the narrative around the way we portray it and, and, and the types of things that we can do as, as organisations, but also as individuals to help resolve that. We make many mistakes as individuals on the way we communicate to our, ourselves as well. And as an example, we're very good at explaining what we do. I interpret aeromagnetic data to help the mining sector to find and target mineral systems. Yeah, that, that. But, but in that sentence, I didn't explain why I would do that. It's really interesting, right? So that's the kind of thing. So every geologist I know is really great at explaining what they do and none of them, not, almost none of them will explain why. And that's a big theme of this too. And then there's other things we, we can talk about as we go, but there's lots of mistakes we make around. If I hear you correctly, what you're trying to do is dissociate the science, the earth sciences or the geosciences from the one industry or one industrial aspect of it, which is mining, and then the impact on society as well. Yeah, Is that an appropriate way to say it? No, it's the opposite, actually. It's like we actually have to be really good at explaining why we need mining is one way to, to, to look at it, right? So, so rather than saying what we do, which so we extract metal out of the earth, it's like, why do we need to do this? Yeah, so that's the important thing that we are missing in the, in the conversation. Now, I think internally in our broader community, we're, we are pretty good at telling each other this. 
And so we have become a bit of an echo chamber where we go, of course, we're, you know, critical minerals are super important for, you know, mitigating climate change, you know, and, and I tell you that and or Steve and we get the joke. But if I tell my mother that or my friend who's a HR manager, he or she just look at me like, what are you talking about? Mining's dirty. So that's the disconnect that we're really talking about. And it's a real challenge, right, because people have now have got a preconceived idea and, and a belief set that we have to turn around. And that's the narrative, their narrative actually, is really what you fall upon when you met with complex problems. And mining is a really complex problem, right, because you, at one level you look at the mine and you go, as a geologist, I, I get all excited. But, you know, but as a, someone who's not a geologist, you look at that and you see a scar on, on the earth's surface, right, as an example, but at the same time, head around the corner and buy a new car. Do you know what I mean? Which is full of materials that have been extracted from a series of mines around the planet, right? And so, and and mitigating climate change is going to be more of that. And so, so that's a complex problem, right? And so, the brain, when that when it deals with that, really gets really goes back to it tries to it tries to simplify that complexity back to one thing, which is what do I believe in? Do you know what I mean? And they land back at I believe mining's dirty, and they can forgive all the other behaviors and so one of our challenges is to get up to get around that and that's what this talk really is about the other thing that's talk that i've been giving tries to do is to celebrate earth sciences what a great discipline we're in right it's it's like the lifestyle the problems that we look at amazing right the earth is your laboratory and in many ways i feel like we've lost that message to the community as well so Pete, I guess the problem that you're proposing is kind of this problem that our industry almost always has, where the dissonance between the producer and the consumer, you know, where the consumer doesn't really know where these things come from. Yeah, you know, on our podcast we talked about, you know, like mining needs the organic food movement so people know exactly where their stuff's coming from and then that. Do you care to comment why you think as an industry, we don't make those associations. I mean, I know we are trying to now. You know, you kind of see some mining companies trying to play a role in that. But do you care to comment, yeah, like in your opinion, why uh, the industry doesn't do it? Uh, I don't think they've had to do it in the past. So it really is in the, pre a decade ago. It was an easy sell to, to get graduates, for example, to participate in, in the mining sector because you could say, look at this great salary. And people go, oh, yeah, this is really cool. I can go get a job and do that. And, and when I was an undergraduate, BHP and Western Mining and Rio were, were companies that aspired to work for. You know, I did an internship with BHP and I, was, I used to walk around the office in, in Melbourne and just be in awe of what they were doing. You know what I mean? It was like, this is amazing. And I'm a Gen X. I actually grew up in a, in a period of the 80s where there was pretty economically tough times. So two recessions close to each other. And so the job and the security that a job has was coveted. It's different today. So the Gen Z, if we wind forward to my kids, they look at the world with a very different lens to us. And, and, and part of that lens is they definitely want high paying jobs. Don't get me wrong. I'm not going to try and make these kids martyrs because they're not. They actually aspire to have well and great careers like the rest of us. But they also look at their job or their career with the lens of purpose and meaning and ethics. And that is something that I think our industry has been a little slow to acknowledge. And we have to acknowledge that in order to attract the best talent into, into our sector. And we're seeing that now. We're seeing kids walk away from earth science schools all over the country and basically with their feet moving over to environmental science and to and, and climate science, as an example, if you're interested in, in earth topics or they just go and do physics and chemistry. We have a thousand physics graduates in the first year and only 400 earth scientists. So, Pete, you know, we kind of talked about the fact that there is these links between kind of the, the science, the industry, and then the societal need. You know, isn't there an argument that selling earth sciences purely as a mechanism of kind of getting into the extractive industries, that's kind of also set up to a point where when students look at this science, that relationship between the extractive industries and the science is a detriment to people coming into the science? That's a complicated question, right? So the short answer is, I think at in a simplistic view you're right it's like in the past we in the academic community have been able to sit around an open day and say you want a great paying job here's a career path that would suit you and it works really well now we we used to have pictures of mining and exploration all over our brochures as part of our marketing to to society and that's all been stripped back and there are groups in, in my school for example 
who firmly believe that we shouldn't teach resources at anywhere near first year or second year of, of, uh, of our undergraduate curriculum. And only when we capture them into a, a love of the discipline, do we then introduce them to the, the you know, economic geology, for example. I, I have a different perspective of that. I actually think that as an education experience, you're probably better off explaining why extraction of raw materials is not only important but necessary and, and what it would look like otherwise. So I teach the first year resources section and we are really focusing on, on aligning with the resources industry that covers bulk commodities and critical metals, et cetera, very briefly, and aligning it to the sustainability goals of the United Nations. It's an easy purpose sell if you do it that way. You can say, here's the purpose for doing this. We want to you know, remove poverty. We want to mitigate climate change. We want to have some food and water security. This is why we need these things. So the academic spend slack in doing that. So we've been a bit naive and, and lazy in the way we've communicated why we would teach earth science the way we do. And of course, you know, academics are interested in other things as well. So we are pretty good at teaching this mountain range is really awesome. This is why you'd want to go and do work in the Himalaya. That's what we do well. We haven't done the other stuff well, and that's the thing that needs to change. One obvious question I have is how much responsibility do you think academics have in making the link between the science and the application to society? And how much do you think responsibility that industry has to actually show that link between industry and the societal need? Again, it's a very complicated question because it's in our interest to do it because we're the pipeline, we're at the start of it. They come into university and so if they don't see the connection or they see a negative connection between it, then in terms of self-interest, our survival as geoscience schools is jeopardised. The challenge that the industry has is that, in, you know, I, I, I'll use the BHP ad as an example, right? So the, the Think Big ad, I thought this was going to be the greatest free hit for earth sciences ever. But, it, you know, it kind of finished on, the first round finished off with a large mine, you know what I mean, that big open pit somewhere. And that was the lasting image that that ad gave. And then the next generation of it was the copper ad with each windmill, wind, wind turbine will require four tons of copper, et cetera. Yeah, that was a much more positive message that ended up on in front of everyone's TVs. But something didn't quite sit right with me when I sat there. And I've spoken to a couple of geologists and they say the same. And I've never really got to the bottom of why that's the case, given that's such a positive message. And in the end, I think one of, the, one of my colleagues said to me, people have a distrust of it. Do you know what I mean? The message is coming from an industry that they distrust. So they've already got a lens of, I don't believe this. So to go back to your question is why is it important that academics are engaged with this? That distrust might be different. Do you know what I mean? So it's not like they're looking at us going, you've got a vested interest in that, that industry. But when you explain as someone who's potentially got, uh, you know, is quite neutral and, and, and there's not, no conflict of interest in the message, says it, then there's an element of trust that's there. So that's why I think it's important that academics um, don't hide behind this message and celebrate the mountain range and the rift basin, et cetera, and actually also be brutally honest around that. So do you think that it, in general people are sensitive to PR messages, so one-way messages? I think... People, when challenged by something that doesn't fit the way they think about the world, they go back to the way they think about the world and then they go and recruit a bunch of people that agree with them and then they, that affirms their belief set. So it's, it's hard to shift. So that one-way message and it's 30-second grab is if it's a repeated thing over many years, it probably becomes part of the basic thinking. But I'm not so sure how effective that, that is to sell the importance of extraction you know for a three-month campaign on channel nine at 8 30 in the evening and to be honest on tv it's me and my wife watching as 50 year olds not my 13 year old son who's actually watching youtube so i might be missing the audience that you really want to be engaged with how do your own kids deal with this just as a matter of interest so great question steve I, <laughs> my kids do not care it's bizarre so i've got nieces and nephews who are a bit older and they're, they're militant in their desire to save the planet. And one of my, my niece, for example, who's 17, was on the last climate march, basically calling the Prime Minister on ABC TV, all sorts of expletives, right? And she was super proud of it. It was like a bit embarrassing, to be honest. Not, not embarrassing you know, that her message, but, you know, that's the way she would speak to about someone who's an authority. 
But also when I engage with them, it's really interesting. I go, well, you know that you can't have climate mitigation without a mine. And then I explain all the reasons in, in some sort of you know, simple way. Like, like, And what happens is they don't connect it. They still think the mining is bad. And so this is the long game that we have to play. I think in our kind of discussions, you know, part of the problem comes from the fact that the perception is that the mining industry is the one that's stealing the future. Yeah, in some ways, they're going to cause the problems that we want to avoid in the future. But there hasn't really been the connection between the fact that we're actually the products that we are actually providing are really going to be what the solutions for the problems in the future are going to be built around. Yeah, absolutely. There's the conundrum in, in the mindset. It's like, that's the problem. And part of it is to the average punter, a mine's a mine. So a copper and cobalt mine is something that's you know the same as a coal mine. They are actually very different propositions in terms of what the future looks like. So we need to be better at actually explaining the differences in that. And, you know, and so I've, I've got a mate, Rick Sly, some of the audience will know Rick, right? And I was having a bit of a rant about coal to him over a few beers one day. And he said, what are you talking about? And I said, this is how I feel. And, and he goes, well, actually, we would be better off extracting, as you know, high-quality coal from the Bowen Basin than letting um, India burn their, their horrible brown coal for the next 20 years. And what it made me realise was that it was actually a whole series of trade-offs that we, we've got to we've got to have, during A, during the transition out of out of fossil fuels into renewable energy or electrified future. But we just haven't explained this to anyone as well. People don't understand the difference between mines. They don't understand the difference between Gippsland brown coal and, and Bowen Basin black coal. You know, these are different propositions and have different outcomes. And, and they, but it all gets blanketed into one. So the nuancing of the conversation is really all. And that's a hard one to get over. But the other thing that's challenging too is we don't come across as an industry that is very good at listening to people. And it's super critical, right? It's like when people feel like they're being listened to, they get more receptive to your messaging as well, right? They'll listen back. But if you're yelling at them about you're telling them how it is, that's a tough one. The walls just come up and they don't listen at all to the message. So This is something we've talked about on this show before as well in that one thing that our industry probably has to take the blame for is that we tend to be very reactionary and then it's more about damage control when these issues come up in society rather than the education aspect, which is what you're talking about. We don't play the education long game. We just want to play the damage control short-term game. And that's really kind of how you know, like our media side of the business or the industry is really set up. And then the detriment of that is that People don't listen to you because the whole trust issue or the fact that, you know, they think your information is somewhat tagged with self-interest in that sense. That's a pretty brutal way to put it, right? You know, I've been introduced to, the, you know, the concept of ethical fading. These are the moments in time where you get, if you get it horribly wrong, then it takes magnitudes more time to do the damage, right? So. I could use a bunch of them. In fact, I'm not even going to use a geoscience example. I'm going to use a, the Olympics next week. So Athlete X discovers a new drug that gives them some performance enhancement, right? And so they take the drug, but the testing isn't available to, to recognise it yet, and they win a gold medal. That's cheating, right? But there's no governance or rules around the Olympics that has prevented that actual moment from happening. And so, therefore, that athlete has all the rights to inject whatever that is substance into their body because it's you know under the current governance structure or the legislation it's okay it doesn't pass the pub test do you know what i mean it just is that and so when a mining company does the same thing the duke and caves is probably a great example in the recent history now rare had every right to do that they did you know all the legislation etc as far as i understand it, is pretty good but it doesn't sit well with the average punter sitting in in the pub in brunswick or in, in brisbane somewhere they just look at that and go well why would they do that and that's detrimental in the long term. And so when Rio want to, as an example, and, I'm, and I don't really want to pick on individual companies because I don't know really anyone in Rio, but they that message lasts a long time and creates the distrust. So when you have a more positive message, it gets ignored. And executives in companies, et cetera, have got their short-term incentives. And so these sorts of things tend to paint um, a bias towards decision-making and there's not this sort of long-term vision around their workforce, for example, whether they will get graduates in the future. There's lots of people talking about, oh, if we run out of geologists, we'll just recruit chemists and physicists and train them in postgraduate courses to treat them. But it's like, same problem. 
why would a physicist who looks into the industry and go, this, these guys are extraction dirty, unethical, whatever, why would they want to go and work there? We have to be seen as a destination industry, right? And which means that our messaging has to be that we are positive, we solve problems that are relevant and aligned with the values. Well, we offer a value proposition that is good for society. That's right, exactly. I mean, yeah, in a lot of ways, we haven't really done that. I mean, we've been forced to do that now, but yeah, that, that's not something that we as an industry probably did very well. And the value proposition is really obvious, right? It's like if we want to mitigate climate change as an example of a societal problem that everyone's engaged with now, mainly around the planet, then you can't achieve that without resources. Like, you know, if you can't grow it, you have to mine it, right? So That's right. So everything that you look around that you can't grow, you know, if you still want that in your life, it's going to have to get mined at some point. That's right. So that raises an interesting one for me, which is why agriculture isn't tarnished with the same brush. Mm -hmm. I think their value proposition to society is a lot clearer. I I think that's really what they have solved. I think that every day when you sit down and you you eat a meal, that it's obvious. But when you pick up your mobile phone or you open your door or look out your window, the connection between the industry that creates that for you and it actually is, is, is not there so that's the hurdle so and and as i said before the analogy is when you see the farmers federation put on a tv ad they show two things they show the 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 paddock with a with with some really happy looking sheep or cattle we are eating grass and then they show the family at the end you know carving up a piece of meat and enjoying a good time together so they paint two very different parts of the process the start and the end and the bit in the middle, which is the thing that's not palatable to most people, is not shown, which is the abattoir. Whereas we do the opposite. We just show the mind. We celebrate the mind and we underemphasize the end product. And we don't talk about the starting product, which is, you know, beautiful as well. Yeah, I mean, there's not a lot of cooking shows that as their backdrop use an abattoir or something like that, right? Like, yeah, there's a reason why they use the backdrops that they do in that sense. Yeah, and I, you know, the abattoir idea is not mine. It's, it's Steve's. When he told it to me, I was like, oh. Yes, and I've never made that connection, right? It didn't, but... It's interesting yeah. that we, we don't really care about a mine. A mine is nothing aesthetic to anyone, even in the mining industry. It's just no. an outcome. Yeah, it is what it is, right, that, to anyone in the industry. And the other thing we, we don't do very well in Australia, which is something we really should do much better, is we need to shout to the world that we have some pretty good governance and rules and regulations around the way we can extract our materials, which is unlike... The rest of the world. I saw a talk recently by um, Murray Hitzman who mentioned in this talk that only 19% of all resources extracted from the planet are regulated. And that's a frightening um, proposition in, in my mind. And so when you have a, a country like Australia, which is resource rich, has you know some pretty stringent regs around and governance around the way that you can operate and your license to operate is strict, then society should be looking at places like us and going, that's where we need to be sourcing our cobalt from or our nickel or whatever. Do you know what I mean? So not somewhere where, the, where there's some serious ethical issues around. So that is a trend that we can see that ethical supply is going to become a key issue. Oh, yeah. So in the next 10 years, Generation Z will be 30% of the global workforce and they, their lens is ethical. When they buy product, they will want to know that that battery in that mobile phone comes from, not from us and mining in the Democratic Republic of Congo. They'll be asking that question. At the moment, there's a lack of awareness around that. But once that becomes more obvious, they'll start asking them, or what's the environmental damage of the rare earth elements that you're uh, putting into that, that wind farm? You know what I mean? These are the conversations that are starting to happen now. And they're really happening around things that um, are tangible to young people at the moment, like, you know, does that perfume have animal products in it, right? But it will be the batteries and the raw materials next. But we better be ready for it. I mean, there's a great example of that, yeah, like how the changing of the consumer conscience has had an effect on the industry. I mean, the fashion industry is a clear example of it. The whole concept of sweatshops that were used by a lot of kind of companies, that all companies had to take a stance in the fact that, you know, they had to be the ones to change the regulatory environment in a lot of countries because of what their consumers were asking them to do. So there are clear examples of this thing uh, happening. You you made the concept about animal testing on cosmetic products and things like that. The industry, again, had to make a stance and change regulations because of that. Yeah, otherwise they become extinct. Yeah, I mean, the one difference with 
mining will be that materials that we need will always be required. So the choices of not having a you know concrete slab, for example, or having one is something that in some ways I think that's kind of been a barrier to this conversation around what's necessary and what's not at this stage, right? So you can choose not to have perfume. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, like there's always been market demand of our product, so we didn't have to try too hard because you could always get someone to buy it. Yeah, that, that's been the change. Yeah. So that's kind of the industry side, right? So you've been an educator for a while. What change have you seen in kind of the social conscience of people coming into geoscience? Have you, like, have you seen a change in the fact along the line? The kids are more serious now. So when I say, you know, young adults, uh, they when they show up to university, they're, they're yahooing in the fun times that used to be had are less so. So they're really more focused on their education outcome. And I think it's because they pay more. And disappointingly so, they see that in themselves as an education consumer and so that they pay for and they expect something in, in return that's of value and which is keeping us on our toes. The other thing is in the past, you could tell a student something about what they needed to learn and they would accept you as, uh, as an authority. And I think that young adults more and more are, are wanting to curate their education experience. And so they want to do a little bit of this and, uh, and something of that. And so whilst I, I quite like that, it's challenging for some of our in science education, for example, because there's kind of a minimum amount of knowledge that you really need to accumulate before you could possibly call yourself a professional geologist. And that's important to acknowledge that. Can I ask a question which I really wanted to ask and you've answered it already? You know, has the value proposition of universities or educators had to change over that time as well? I can talk about three generations of education because when I was a student and when I was an early career lecturer and and Steve will remember these days as well and today so personally I think education is better now than it was when I was an early career educator and, I, and, and not because the information is different or, or, or whatnot it's that when I was when we were when I was a young man many moons ago now you show up to a lecturer there was no recording of it and so you were expected to engage with the lecturer even if it was listen really hard and take notes really fast but there was a cognition in the way that you were taught. You were actually writing down the information that was being portrayed and you often made mistakes, et cetera. And sometimes the lecturer would put notes down and then spend 10 minutes just telling you something about the discipline, right? That's how it used to work. And then these young bucks came along, Pete Betts, Steve Beresford at, at Monash circa 2001. And I was the first person in, in, our, in our school to introduce a, a PowerPoint lecturer. <laughs> at the time, I thought I was a legend. And I was a disgrace. So I was like, I introduced the worst thing ever. Yeah. So you're responsible for all the problems subsequent. I was, right. So And so what happened was, in that moment, that was that whatever information you put onto the PowerPoint, that became that information. That's right. And so what happened was, when I was, when I was being lectured, I was being told a bunch of stuff. I was taking extra notes and, my, and I would have gaps in my notes. So I'd have to go off and read. Whereas, you know, you hand the PowerPoint out. And the way I present is... I put a couple of dot points on the PowerPoint to remind me what to say. And, and my expectation early on was that those students would go and read on, read about sort of subduction zone in a textbook or whatever. And, and that wasn't happening. So you'd go and ask a question in an exam about you know, the dynamics of a subduction and you'd get the three dot points that you'd put on your PowerPoint back at you. So it had really changed the expectations of the students. And so now, so if we wind the clock forward now, Whilst we still do PowerPoint because it's a great way to present visuals, we're trying to blend our learning so that there's more interaction in the way we teach with the lecturer and the student. If my preference is we would never have lectures and never have practicals, which is the way we would do it, we would have workshops where we would have a small amount of information exchange. You go away and do something, you cognitively work with the problem and then you go back and you might present some more information and we've tried that and it works really well the students love it because they um, engage whereas if you have a traditional lecture practical they don't show up to the lectures at all pre-covid everything's online now pre-covid and so you'd get 10 percent show up to your lecture and then half of them wouldn't have watched the lecture that's been recorded and given to them and so they've got no idea what's going on in, in the prac so these are the sorts of challenges that and so you end up having to, you know, portray more information, give more information to get them prepared for the prac at the start, start of the prac. 
So the blended learning mechanisms are, are, are much better now. And there's some really talented educators in the system. I used to think I was okay at it, but actually when I, I have a self-assessment and, and then I go and look at what some of the young people are doing is think, hey, you are amazing. Right? What, what, how lucky are you to be sitting in, as a student in that person's classroom, right? They're engaging. They're also mixing and matching it and they're really embracing the technology. Some of us older guys are still hanging on to the old ways. But... So I think it's a positive thing. I, I think it's better. But, you know, university as a community and a campus where you just go at the start at 9 o'clock at the start of the day and hang there all day and end up meeting up with your mates at 4 o'clock and going to the pub. That's not a thing anymore. That's students show up to if they have to and, and everything else is dig- digital. So And we have to embrace that. My daughter's a nurse and she, I talked to her about it. She goes, I love online lectures. And, and I said, why? You know, because as a lecturer, I like engaging with the, with the audience. She goes, well, actually, when I don't understand a word or a thing, I can pause it and then I can go off to the internet and look it up and see what it means. And I, the digital element of education is self-paced learning. So that was one part of the question I guess I wanted to kind of get from you. The other part I really wanted to kind of understand is, is the value proposition of going to geoscience changed over time as well? Is the fact that when you kind of started, were people coming to geoscience to become better scientists and then that was their avenue into kind of getting into industry or are they coming into now to basically be ready to go into industry? And, and, you know, the science element is maybe not as important as it probably was. So I would have said, and I, you know, and I was different, but, but the vast majority of my friends who went, I went through university with, who I'm still really good friends with, they... They found geology by accident. It's like in the day you would you go and you know shop to enroll and you you because you did physics and maths and chemistry in high school you'd pick those three and, then, and you have to pick a, and you go oh, do I really want to do biology or an extra maths or advanced chemistry and you go oh hang on a second I'll just do this sounds interesting I'll just do geology right and it was a great model to capture people because they just did it because they had no idea what it was and then they loved it. And especially if you're a bit outdoorsy and, you know, and you like the lifestyle and, you, and it is a fascinating subject and, and you can apply all the other sciences like chemistry and physics and, and math to the planet and get the spoils of the, the other aspects of science and do it on, you know, what, what I think is arguably the most tangible and interesting part of, of, of the science, which is the planet we look on. So that's the way it kind of used to work. I think the kids are coming now with a, a bit more of a preconceived idea so they and if it's not what they want to do they know what they don't want to do and so we have a first year breadth course in in our school and it teaches about a third atmospheric science about a third environmental science and about a third geology so it's really an introduction course and and there is some information that's valuable but 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 ultimately it's you know have a try of all these three things and choose and even if they really really love the geology component at the moment, most of them are walking away after the first year. They've made their mind up beforehand. And we went, oh, hang on a second, it's just the rubbish performance of the lecturers, et cetera. And we changed it and did, you know, and really became engaging and did everything and nothing changed, right? It, it tells you something, in my opinion. And that's why I become big on the narrative, right? And that's and and so we have to win that we have to win the hearts and minds of 16 and 17 year olds. That's the audience. If they're younger than that, they don't care. I show up to my kids' high schools and show all sorts of kick-ass bits of geology, you know, tsunamis and earthquakes and stuff, and they, they're kind of interested, but they're actually more interested in chasing their girlfriends around and whatever, right? It's like they're, they're too young and they don't care and they actually don't care about school that much. You've got to get them when they're right in the window when they're going to go. And, and, and so for me, the, and you can do an enormous amount of effort and try and pick up every kid you know what I mean? Every year, which is like really inefficient. In my mind, the best way to do it is to get the teachers and the career people on board. That's the strategy, right? And my, my experience with school teachers is they kind of find earth science interesting. They can't teach it to save themselves if they're not an earth scientist. And then we, and then we do crazy things too and say, well, why don't we teach, you know, year eights the rock record, rock cycle? It's like, I find the rock cycle boring. Do you know what I mean? So if we're going to ask year eight boys to or girls to to learn rock cycle well that's got, it's, you've got to make it exciting but we expect people that have been trained as mathematicians and biologists and chemists 
to teach it. It's a problem because it's badly taught. And so I show up and I start I teach something to my kid's school. And the guy goes, can I record this and just play it to my next class? Because I kind of make it more engaging for them. You know, I don't talk about the rock songs. It's so boring. I just tell them about, you know, all my field work experience. And Surely no one's ever really been interested in actual rocks. It's not what, it's what they tell you. Yeah, so there's a sort of misunderstanding that the, that the rocks are really like the words in a book. They, they tell the story of the earth and, and it's a wicked story. It's really cool. Any individual rock is no different than the letter E on page 167 of some thousand-page book. It's the combination and the forensics of our discipline that's exciting. I think Stevie nailed it. Knowing, I mean, yeah, some people care about rocks more than others, but actually the reality is the rock is, is the words in, in the book. And the teachers don't explain it like that at all. They go, oh, the sedimentary rock gets heated and pressurised and becomes a metamorphic rock and then eventually temperature rises and it becomes an igneous rock and then it makes its way up. It's like yeah. you know, teaching mass as if the uh, it's not what you do with the mass, it's just the pure nature of numbers. Yeah. And some people love that, but it's the vast majority of it, isn't it? You know, it's, and I'm, I'm one of them. I just, you know. I think it's a good point. You know, if geology was taught as history is, right? Yeah, like maybe you would get more people interested in it because it is essentially unraveling history just through a different mechanism. So what if it was taught that way? If you go back to the time of Darwin, Hutton and stuff, geology was the science. Yeah, 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 that's fine. So, you know, you kind of mentioned these points, Pete. So obviously you're really big on this kind of changing the narrative. Isn't part of the problem that our narrative for a long time has been that, you know, we really want people to know about the rocks and we want them to know about this kind of core part of the science, whereas we could have broadened that narrative to include kind of all of these different ideas and topics in as well? Yeah, so there's multi-elements about our flawed narrative. Some of it is, so the way we communicate is incredibly transactional. That's us. What do you do, Steve? Oh, I'm an expert in nickel sulfides, da, 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 da. And that won't tell me why he's interested or in, you know, does that right. So, I mean, that's part of it. Sometimes when we get excited, we get overexcited and we start scaring people. And that's like, oh, look at this cool tsunami that just killed 10,000 people. Do you know what I mean? It's like, you know... It's really cool, but everyone else is going, this is terrifying. And, 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 and volcanoes are the same, right? One of my favourite all-time greatest science experiences when Steve and I trekked over to White Island and, you know, I was just in awe of the thing. And I remember Steve going, oh, that crater was uh, filled with water that was 100 metres lower than it was at the time and something's going on here. And I was like, this is a bit dangerous, right? And I remember just thinking, this is so cool because it's active and amazing. But actually, walking around on White Island, as it turns out, is actually a dangerous activity. And we just we used to march 15 students around there like it was nothing. It was awesome. But there's a high dread factor in the way we communicate as well. It's like, look at this hazard, look at this. And, and lots of society, society are not coping well with that. And so there's a great paper by Ian Stewart and others who deal with that topic in part of that paper. We are needy at times. And so this, the thing I don't like about the way we communicate is that do you know that the mineral sector contributes to 21% of the annual GDP? People, when you say that, you should, and, it's, and, and, and the message is you should be grateful for us. And no one is, right? No one cares, right? Because you don't see some, someone who works in retail behind the counter go, you should be grateful for me because the retail sector contributes to 29% of the GDP. It's a bizarre argument, right? It's, it's, so, it's actually needy and it comes across that way. And, and I hear that a lot. And I just sit down and I used to say it myself, I used to sell the earth sciences that way. It's like, we're really important. This is what it does for you. And people don't care. And so it's a very disengaging way to communicate what you do because it actually tells you it's a transaction. So this is what you get out of earth science. It's not like, why do we do that? And the last one is we were fear mongers as well. Did you know copper's going to rain in 20 years? Do you know that, you know, that, you know, it's, it's the sky is falling messaging and it's crazy, right? Because, you know, when you walk down the street in, in the CBD of Melbourne and you see a, you know, a group of re religious zealots telling you that the world is going to end, what do you do? Do you go up and embrace with them and then have a conversation or do you run the other way? I know what I do. I look for the next... I look at the next exit and I go for it as fast as I can. And if we are kind of behaving that way, it's hard to engage with people. 
they're the generalities that we make, mistakes that we make, often make as individuals. And the other part of the question was around, you know, is communicating about rocks, is that the way to sell the earth? sciences and the rocks are an integral part of it i've embarked on a mission call it how good is geology every day of every year for billions of years that's i do one a day on facebook and one every second day on twitter just to see what happens and i don't show a rock like don't show a physically show a rock that's like i don't go here's my favorite banded iron formation here's my favorite gabbro i just don't do that right because that's people don't care about that stuff i show spectacular scenery that is rock based like mountain ranges and or you know Sierra or Nevada or Arizona or something. And so I wanted people to understand that when they see something that's beautiful on the earth's surface, that's geology. And that's the message that, that I'm trying to get across. So that, and this is, and this messaging is not really for other geologists, people who comment back and they're geologists, or sometimes they do, but mainly people who go, wow. And so what I'm trying to do is get a connection between something that is beautiful and magnificent and make them think that that's geology. And then their perceptions of geology will shift away from the, the consult focus on the extractive industry to something that's not. The point that you're trying to make, I think, is something that we as a science probably haven't done very well. When the physics community is trying to attract people, you know, they don't talk about the nitty gritty of physics. They go, this is your avenue to understand the universe, right? And the same in medicine, right? This is your avenue to help people. Most GPs, if you ask him, why did you become a GP? And, you know, the common thread would be the fact that they wanted to help people. This was the avenue to get there. The next point that I want to talk about is the fact that, or you've already talked about the fact that, you know, we are struggling to attract people. I think our narrative has been so niche in the way of attracting people that this was quite a predictable problem we were going to get to at one point where we became a very niche science or became a very niche discipline for people going to universities. And then so when, yeah, in kind of a COVID environment where the environment changed, say the economic environment for universities has changed, probably made geology or geosciences or earth sciences very susceptible to basically go extinct because of that, because we became a niche science in that sense. Yeah, so the examples that you gave are classic examples of how other disciplines communicate. The medical doctor, who, why do you, I became a doctor because I wanted to help people. That's an explanation of why they don't go, I became a doctor because I was you know, completely obsessed with the human anatomy. I really love the DNA sequence of blah, blah, blah. Like. Exactly. They don't say that. So, and even a PhD students in, in biomedicine, they, you go, what do you do? And they go, helping finding a cure for cancer. And then you dig in there and they're actually dicking around with some enzyme or protein, right? It's like, it's towards the ultimate goal, but we don't have that, a stronger message be, what do you, why do you do geology? It's like, because I want to, you know, make sure that human society is better for, for having a secure food and water and mitigate against climate change. If you just said that, people would listen to you more than if you go, I just really like the gabbros. Nickel sulfides. Sorry, Steve. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so, um, and, and so the other disciplines have got this. And so I've done a bit of a hunt around on, 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 on geoscience websites, and every page is the same. We do this. Not even a why statement at the front of anyone's page. It's like, this is what we do. That's an easy hurdle to change, right? Because we our, our why story is great. Do you know what I mean? And it's really relevant to every everyone but we still insist on it. So actually one of the, my favourite slides in my talk is, is the, I pull up a, a website from a society in the USA about being an environmental scientist and it, and it says, why should you be an environmental scientist or what's an environmental scientist? And it says, you will, you know, this is such a diverse discipline that you will spend your life travelling the world and or getting to choose to work from home. Or It talks about your lifestyle and then you go to the Australian government's website and for geology and geophysics, and it goes, you will take notes on describing rocks and talk to surveyors and engineers. It's 20 tasks. And if imagine a 15-year-old looking at that going, it sounds kind of a bit crap. Do you know what I mean? So it's all the messaging across the sector. So why is the key? And the why can be done by individuals and it can be done by um, universities and it can be done by industry. That's the critical. You've been out there kind of talking to people. Give me an idea of what the temperature of the room is when you say stuff like that. Yeah, are people offended? Are people, uh, yeah. People think I'm anti-mining. It's really bizarre. Not everyone. I have a little caveat before I say to go, before I start talking, I just want you to know that I am not anti-mining. I'm actually very pro-mining in such a way that I think it's the only way 
to fix some of our problems that we've created, right? And so I would say there's a strong demographic barrier between the audience. So lots of people are great from all age groups. They just go, oh, thank you for, you know, I've never heard of being put together this way. It's really opened my mind to the way we talk about it, et cetera. But, but there is a cohort of people who find it challenging. Usually it's older scientists. And so when I say older, older than me, I'm 50. So, and I think they find it challenging because I think they make a connection that's not fair and, and for them where they say, oh, Pete Betts is running around saying that whatever we did in the past was, and it's not the message at all, right? Our, our prosperity and as a nation has been on the back of these, the expertise and the excellence of past geoscientists, right? So that needs to be celebrated at the same time. All I'm saying is we need, times have changed and we need to change with them. That's if I had to summarize the message and which, which is changing the way we talk about ourselves. And so I don't want past geologists to think that I, that whatever they did was not okay. It was completely okay in the context of the times. And so I think some of that is there. And then sometimes I say crazy stuff like you actually need to have more iron ore to, to rid the world of poverty. Like that's a pretty outrageous thing to say, but it's actually true. It's like any nation that's pulled out its lower class into middle class has done that on the back of the infrastructure which is concrete and steel. Let's be clear about that. And so if you want to make a nation that's third world into, into you know, transition to a first world country, you actually have to build infrastructure. But when you say it as bluntly as, you know, steel and concrete is the way out of poverty, people just go, oh, you're talking rubbish, right? But I'm oversimplifying a, a complex problem. But I use it as an example of is some of the things that we don't sell that message at all, right? Because what's the alternative? People still burn whatever carbon resources they have next to their caves in, you know, federal, you know, or huts or slums or whatever. That's not a sustainable future. Yeah, that's why I'm. You and I have had this conversation, like, you know, offline around the fact that this whole concept that people want, they don't want mining. It's okay, you know, if that's your proposition. But what world do you actually want to paint where we don't have this? Do you, are you going to push society back to a point, what, like 100 years? Because life wasn't that great. It's been our ability to find these resources and extract them in a sustainable way. And the definition of sustainability has also changed over time. So let's acknowledge that as well. But what's your proposition then if you want to get rid of this? Yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. I think the other thing you need to add to that not, is not only resources, it's, a, it's the ability to add technology to that raw material and create something. And so the difference between, a, say, an Australian economy and, and other similar looking com- economies that are third world is that we've probably got a better technology basis to, to, to do the A, the extraction, and B, what we can do with it, et cetera. It's really hard. I, I look at this in um, from the same the problem that you articulated in multiple fronts, and I think it's a real Western affluent, privileged and entitled way to think about the world. It's like I have a friend, Verity, who was a geoscientist and now she's in public policy in, in government. She had to go to a conference with me and she got talking to an Indigenous chap and he was completely pro-mining and she was a little bit surprised by that, you know, but this gentleman articulated to her that mining was part of the pathway out of improving the quality of life for his people in Australia. So, you know, it's when you don't have to think about whether your water's fresh or whether you're going to have a roof over your head or that when you turn the light switch on, it's going to happen, that you can start to form opinions about the righteousness of, you know, of of the resources industry. And Europeans have been classics at it for, for decades. It's like not in my backyard. You can actually do whatever you want in Africa and we'll enjoy the spoils of it, but that's not right either, right? So a lot of this nonsense that we here around no mining etc is is a western world thing because we don't have to think about it because we get to enjoy those spoils of that mining without thinking about it whereas other parts of the world where there's lots of mining are living in 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 poverty and so they're really and you see it in the behavior so many third world countries are all over the sustainability goals of the united nations and how geology links into that they've mapped it out years ago and we're just starting to think about it in Australia. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you look at government policy in places like Vietnam, Ghana, yeah, like they have a much more evolved understanding of how the resources industry or extractive industries are really going to play a part in their country building and all of that stuff. Yeah, it's nation building stuff. And we did it 70 years ago. And we've always been on the back of Western European colonialism. But the, but the reality is, for many of these countries, that's their 
halfway out of it. And so we've got some... I mean, we've had this like opinion on our podcast before that if you have a proposition where you don't want mining, I think that's a totally legitimate proposition if you also accept that you're going to have to inherit technology from then on because you won't be able to buy it. Yeah, and, and, and if that's the case, if that's your proposition, then try to convince people of that. Yeah, and I think that's a pretty tough proposition. I can't wait to see the, the three kids of mine fighting over my Mustang. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. But that's legitimately the end product of this kind of strategy. If that's what we're going to go down, then that's really realistically what we're talking about. Or you decrease the population, right? So it's like what we're really talking about is, is inability to, to make connections between what we take for granted what we value and what's required to to have those things. So it's pretty that it's pretty much down to that. And so, and we have as a geoscience community is we have to be more engaging with the community to help those connections be made. And there's so few geoscientists in the public sphere out and about doing outreach and being doing the things that are really required and, and and because most academics for example would prefer because because of their personalities and because of their passions etc and, and they're all legitimate reasons would prefer to focus on their um, research interests others will prefer to focus on their education agendas but it's very hard to get an academic to to march out into a high school or to, a, to the Pramburn Botanical Gardens to give a talk to 150, you know, people who are interested in science. When you talk to them, they are fascinated by what you've got to say. I make this comment, yeah, I can't remember the exact number now, but for one of our previous episodes, we did this, or I did this study to just see how many geologists or people related to the mining industry had been in the state parliament in WA, right? And it wasn't a lot. It was very few. And if I look at how many people with a farming background had been in the state parliament, it was substantially more. So as a community, I think your point that, you know, if you do want to try to change that narrative, then we probably will have to take on a little bit more rather than just being interested in kind of our research project or our business venture or something like that. Just to add a few comments on that, as somebody who's tried to engage with Canberra, there's not a lot of respect for the people who try to do advocacy, for the people who try and teach the general public. What, why have we not valued outreach? It's like, why shouldn't we be standing on the roof and shouting and celebrating what we do? Because it's awesome. I think there's no greater science than earth science. And now I'm biased, but why don't we want to share this with the broader community is, is something that's really it's a bit troublesome and I have to, you know, confession 101, I probably was that person a decade ago. And part of it is, well, part of this two, this, well, there's two parts to this, right? You have to have the confidence to just get out there and say it. And so lots of people aren't. And so they, it's easier not to. So you got to put yourself out of your comfort zone often to do that. And one of the challenges that scientists in general have around communication is that we know that there's no absolutes and the public sees the world in absolutes so if you say we'll run out of copper in 25 years and i'm just making some random statement up then they will see that as an absolute but what that what in your mind you know that that's not entirely true because you know there's a whole bunch of sub-economic resources that will become economic etc cetera, etc cetera, right and so you have to somehow fight that communication barrier and it's easier to do if you tell them why you do it rather than give them all the facts do you know what i mean because the facts are the absolutes and the why you do it is actually touching a different part of their brain. So Pete, in your experience, do you think part of that has been, are there two facets to why people maybe don't not do it? And I'm interested to know whether you face these or not. Is one of them the fact that you have to be brave? Yeah, like you are probably going to wear some hits along the way. And possibly because of the history of our industry, you're probably going to wear more hits than others. Is, is that part of the reason? In your experience, is that something that, held you back from doing it before yes yeah, so like self-confidence is one for me so that's that people probably laugh at that now but actually in the past i was pretty nervous public speaker and it was challenging and the other thing is it's you do as a geoscientist if you touch upon the wrong i'll use an example i was at cranberry botanical gardens giving a general science talk to the botany department or whatever it was in some amateur group who were really interested in science and i gave you know i talked about 
all sorts of things, but I talked about climate change a little bit and how the role of geology in, in, in climate change. But there was a handful of people and who were really brutal, including a nana who was like, I don't believe in that. You're just talking nonsense, da 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 da, right? And it's like I could sit there and, you know, I chose not to. Or I could sit there and argue some data or not. So, so in the end, I chose to just say, well, we, we can have a difference of opinion. It was kind of be respectful. But at the end of the day, and at other times you get the opposite. You go, well, you're just part of the, the extractive industry, you know. So you do cop it. But I think you've got to expect that. I find that the scientific argument's more challenging. So sometimes you might, the concept that you might not fully remember, you know, a concept that you're not that familiar with. And so someone asks you a question and you might have to explain it in a way that you're very comfortable with, for example. So they're the things that I think scientists struggle with. It's like, what if I say the wrong thing? to that group of people. And actually the only person who's caring about whether you say the right or the wrong thing is you. That's right. Because they don't know, right? It's like, as long as you're not proliferating, you know, sort of nonsense, then get the general message across. The public outreach is... The reason why I asked that question is I think this is, yeah, in my um, experience, I think that seems to be one of the reasons why people don't want to talk about it. Yeah, I think even in personal circles, like, you know, if you're at a dinner table, depending on who's on that table, like, you know, sometimes you don't feel like talking about the fact that you may belong to mining. Yeah, and that's something that consciously sometimes we do because maybe because of the stigma attached to what we do or what our industry does, all of those things. I've had that experience and these people bagging mining and, and sometimes I go, I did the challenge approach where I go, well, tell me more about why you think that way and, you know, and I'm going to try and nod them up, and which is quite easy to do, but just to enlighten them on sort of to soften their opinions. You don't always get to get to change it. The other challenge we have is that we have some very influential geoscientists out there who have strong opinions about things. I'm not, you know, climate, something like climate deniers might be an example, right? But there's other ones as well, right? So people who might be pro you know, certain types of mining, etc. They get a disproportionate uh, amount of the decibels that are available to the public and part of the reason is because they're willing to get out there and give their opinion right and so if, if you don't if the rest of us who have di- a different opinion or have a different take on our discipline don't get out and, and start talking about it then the only the only thing that that the community hears the voice of the few and the loudest and so that's also been challenging for our community as well because we haven't really we haven't really wanted to get into a public debate on controversy on controversial topics because of this fear that we'll be shouted out of the room or, or, or whatever so it's like it's and I don't want to pick on any particular topic but that but it is common so if you if someone is super passionate about something and even if they're in a small pocket of the community if they talk the loudest and the most often and get the best forum then they become their surrogate representative of our discipline and unfairly so, in my opinion. We talked about this with the kind of the pre-interview. Yeah, like and I think your point is a really valid one in that sense. And it also kind of harbors back to the original point you made is that because we feel this kind of problem, we don't allow a lot of outside opinions in either. So, yeah, so we become this kind of echo chamber in that sense as well. I mean, I think I mentioned to you, like, you know, we've had relationships with the IMAR conference. And, you know, obviously the people that protest that conference also protest us. And, yeah, like, I'm happy for them to come on and talk on our show about what problems they have with our industry. Because it's pretty hard to sometimes get an unfiltered view on what do we do well and what do we do badly if you don't allow those kind of opinions to come through. The echo chamber is massive. And it's loud and it's, it booms. And it's comfortable. Do you know what I mean? So all echo chambers are, you, you've actually got your tribe and the tribe all believes in the same thing as you. And so that's the easy pathway. You have to step out of your tribe and listen to other people to get a different perspective. I actually think, in my opinion is, we are disjointed as a community in general. So we have lots of people trying to fix this problem in lots of different ways, lots of really good ideas out there, and it's actually not coordinated in, in any way or sense. And in fact, there are different groups doing disparate things. We, what we need to do is have a coordinated approach with a, a national strategy, which is which starts with the narrative. So we all sing from the same songbook and we sing it loud together. So 
universities, governments and, and the industry. And we engage with young people, but probably more importantly, educators that are in secondary schools and possibly primary schools. Because if you train the teacher, then they will be more confident. I actually think we need to look at our curriculum. That's a harsh thing to say because, you know, we academics like to teach their passion and they teach that the best. So the argument has been in the past, oh, there's four things that we need to teach in, in geosciences, structural geology, igneous geochemistry, sedimentary geology, metamorphic geology, you know, applied geophysics, whatever the topic. And everyone's got a slightly different opinion. But can we con- contextualise those things around societal problems, for example, when we teach them? And then we probably need to stop, you know, we probably need to have some sort of mechanism to be able to share our expertise across the sector. So we can't, Monash and University of Adelaide and UWA probably should stop competing. Do you know what I mean? Which is what the model is at the moment. Let's track as, as many students as you can and do that way. So, you know, maybe we need hubs of expertise and they might not be at undergraduate level. They might be at, at a postgraduate level. And those hubs are responsible for particular disciplines. So you could imagine that ANU and University of Tasmania, which have strong seismology groups, for example, they would be responsible for that area. And if you're a postgraduate and you want to to do some training in that, you could either enrol into a master's course there, for example, or do a PhD there. Whereas Monash, it might be structural geophysics and something else. Do you know what I mean? And Adelaide, it's this. And and you know, and Adelaide and us, us might have a hub of expertise and you go there and UTAS and Curtin have some similarities. So you, that's one way to do it. But it takes a restructure of the university sector and there's no appetite for that at the moment, right? Because the reality is academics are literally on their knees in despair. They've been asked unfairly but to pivot without any resources. And so what they've done is they've said, you have to go digital and you have to do it now. And they did it, right? It's unbelievable what they've achieved But, but and, and the heroes in some ways. But to ask a school to modify um, the way they um, go about their business in, in, a, in a pandemic is, is difficult. So, And then the last bit of it is, is that the, the engagement of the societies and the, the AIGs and the GSAs and the OSIMMs, they really need to be doing lots of advocacy and they need to be also working more closely together and being less competitive in my mind. It's like the days where we have to compete with each other are not okay because it's like a nation of tribes and the tribes are all fighting and then one day you have to go to war and fight another nation and you kind of knock half your army off. Do you know what I mean? It's like a, that's the kind of thing. And then the last thing is I think there needs to be an industry intervention now. And so the industry is booming there's, and the pipeline is leaky. And that, and that, I can't describe it any other way. And it leaks around gender and diversity and it leaks in total numbers. And so there needs to be some innovative thinking around. So I think one of the biggest challenges we have is that we have, you know, if you look into an earth science school like mine, you see a bunch of middle-aged white guys. That's the reality, right? And, and Gen Z, very fluid in the way they look at diversity and gender. And so they look at us and go, wow, that's not, what I'm, that's not what I want to be, right? So they go somewhere else. So with the intervention in my mind has to be around putting in talented, young, gender diverse and diverse groups of people to be the next generation. If I had to, you said off the top of your head what, what would that look like, I would say MTech for gender and diversity. So put 25 lecturers funded from industry into the sector, have them absolutely champion the sector, but be visible and in their outreach. So rather than make them do a lot of the you know, hard yards in the classroom, let them shine in society. So people look at them and go, I really want to be like you know, Heather Hanley or Melanie Finch. Or, and, and that way we'll get more females and more diverse groups of people thinking, oh, hang on, there's something in it for us as well. And that's something that we've really balked away from that conversation. And the pandemic has absolutely not helped. We had uh, aspirations to make our staff levels about 40% female by 2025, I think. Unachievable now because guess who? Guess who's on all the contracts and all the casual appointments? Females. And so what happens when, you, uh, when the vice chancellor says, oh, we're getting rid of everyone except for ones we can't get rid of, then everyone who's not a continuing academic is vulnerable. One of the great things about my head of school is that he really tried to prevent that and he did save some very talented young 
um, female and academics and also some young male ones as well. So it's, it takes leadership to do, to do those things and decisions. And then, of course, once we get that right, then the equity issues and the diversity, sorry, not equity, the diversity issues that, that our industry also faces is we'll go part of the way to fixing that. So and that's the conversation that's really, that, the conversation I just had of articulated is actually one that is very active in the university sector at the moment. So Pete, is this a Australian problem or do you think these kind of tribal thing, we need to probably go a little bit further beyond just Australia or Canada or US? So the problem that I've, we've talked about mainly in this podcast is really been around our narrative and, and, our, and how this is affecting the growth of potential of our, of our industry, right? This is a Western problem. We're seeing the numbers almost identical in Australia, UK, Europe, um, North America. Up to 2017, it's about 30% drop off in enrolments in undergraduate courses across geosciences. The numbers, the AGC put together the data for 2013 to 2017, and that was the drop off. The UK data is identical and they had, don't have a mineral sector. So it doesn't, it says it's not the mineral sector that's causing it. It's actually the way people perceive our discipline, right? And so that's, and the USA, they've lost even more. It's been 50% since 2000, almost 50% since in 2019, 2020. But that's also linked to the drop off in available employability in other areas like fossil fuels and, um, environmental sector so it's hard to get a read for that but it is a key point in mentioning the fact that normally when we look at this drop in kind of students coming into the sector you know it's always linked to an impact of the industry or employability but yeah this time there's probably a high num- amount of employability in the sector and yet we are failing to attract people yeah that's been our sin of the past we exonerate ourselves in terms of outreach and marketing because we intimately link the cycle with student numbers and probably for the first time for a couple of cycles, this will go out of sync. We know it now. You know what I mean? So, you know, one of the things that bothers me, Pete, is what I would call the shrinking pool effect, which is as we shrink, we get more competitive with each other and stab each other in the back and the thing just shrinks further and further. So we have, we've been talking about this for a decade or more. Why now? Yeah, so the problem that that the universities are facing now is is exactly the same as it happened in the mid-90s. There's a report called Back from the Brink. I don't know whether the audience might remember it right. It was basically a report that was written for the Minerals Council in Australia, and they recognised that there was a shrinking of the sector, mainly in the the university sector. There has been, and I can't remember all the details, but there were several schools that closed down and or merge. An example of that would be La Trobe University. They used to have a great earth science. But there was University of New England, et cetera, as well. So there's a whole bunch of them. They closed down or shrunk to the point where they were not viable. And so why now is because we're going through the second phase of, and the shrinking happens like this. You shrink down and then you have a period of ballooning and you start to recover and you shrink again. So it's like this, you know, you get smaller and smaller, like Steve says. And so now I think the, the thing that's been superimposed on top of that sort of the, the structural link between, you know, jobs and the thing is the, is the actual change in the mindset of young people as well. So there's two things in play at the moment. It's the sort of boom-bust cycle that has its effect and then there's this completely different group of um, young people who view the world and have different value sets than previously. And that, and it's the first generation that's been completely digital. You know, they can't remember a cassette tape. They don't even know what that is, right? In fact, most of them don't know what an iPod is, right? So I think it's the superposition of those two factors that are that are that are at play at the moment. And, and unless we do something now, I think it's going to be too late. And then and so how do we do the resource sector in a world where the strand system doesn't do it well you end up having to import your talent from elsewhere and it won't be from the uk or the usa or canada or western european it will be from other parts of the world where they're still training their geoscientists of south america africa asia you know what i mean as examples with middle east so and that's if that's the model that people want and uh, value then that's fine but that's the future if we don't arrest the challenges we've got now and people are aware of this, but... So, Pete, what do you personally want out of this? I mean, why are you doing it? Nothing. 
I don't want anything out of it, actually. I just want to raise awareness and I want, I actually want to say, well, I do want something. I want my discipline, the, my, the thing that I love to be loved by other people. That's, there you go. That's the answer. That's, it's that simple. So I do, I, I would say I don't want anything personally from it. I actually, I don't want my discipline to disappear. There you go. That's the root of it. And I, and in fact, I, you know, I spend all my time doing this stuff rather than, you know, interpreting mag images these days. I think that's great. So this is a bit of a plug for you in the sense that when you're doing the pre-interview, you know, you mentioned you are writing a letter to the local council in regional Victoria so they can save basically a geo- geological outcrop so that it can still be used to train people. And I think the fact that you're doing this stuff, I think it's great. Yeah, I, I can't take the credit for that. You know, I, I don't know whether many of the audience might remember a guy called Mike Rates. He lives down in Port Ferry now and he raised the issue and it's the Tower Hill face at, associated with the quarry and the quarry, they want to backfill the quarry and, and with that the face will go. And it's the one example of, you know, a, a surge, um, volcanic surge that, you know, is exposed beautifully and, you know, it would be a shame to lose that. I don't know whether my letter will make a difference, but it, you just got to raise awareness. Mike's been standing on the side of the highway with a big placard for a month trying to get, raise awareness as well. So people are out there trying to do stuff and, one thing I didn't under, understand and appreciate up until recently was the role of the value of geotourism and geoheritage in, 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 our, in our community. And there are some really passionate people out there in that space. And they're kind of silent and not known. And I think it's because the academics are not that respectful of that. They don't say that. And I don't necessarily believe industry geologists are. So they're kind of sitting out there on an island doing great stuff and doing all, you know, and kind of being the, the, you know, at least at the front line of the things that we've been talking about, trying to raise awareness of geosciences to the wider community to celebrate the things that we think are, think are great. Imagine having a geo trail that went all the way around the continent so you could go on a road trip and just stop at a site every 50 kilometres and understand how your continent works. It would be so cool. They're the sorts of things that we can do. We don't have to have a park. That would be awesome as well. But yeah, how many volcanoes are in Eastern Australia? I think there's thousands of them. They're like they're awesome. And I'm not even a volcanologist. Steve's laughing now because I used to tease you about volcanology. But I am. I am. I'm into fossils and volcanoes like there's no tomorrow now. And let's be honest, <laughs> those volcanoes are a lot safer to go to than White Island. So yeah, we should probably encourage people to go there. Have you seen the, the volcanoes on the stamps, the latest yes. round of stamps yeah. that's doing the round at the moment? Yeah. Quite interestingly, I uh, shared it on social media and said, how awesome is this? How great is geology? And then um, you know, some members of our community decided to go, oh, the photos are the wrong hill or the wrong angle. You know, it's like, why do we do that? How often do you get, a, 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 you know, our geoheritage, volcano geoheritage, on our stamps how often does that happen in the past and the answer is never here's our once in a lifetime opportunity to stick it out into the public and go this is amazing and heather who's heather hanley who's been driving this she's got some great youtube videos where she's doing a presentation explaining it at the level for the public and she's been amazing so she's you know she's a real champion of of this as well and we just need more people like that willing to put it out there and 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 sell it and highlight it and celebrate it i think that's great so pete we're at the end of our time so yeah i don't want to take too much of your time but before you go you have to answer two questions for us so the first question is what is something that you think needs to die in our industry it can be a concept a behavior anything that you want to jettison out all right this is an on-the-spot question I, I would like to see fewer websites with mines and tonka trucks and people standing around in hard hats and orange vests very yellow yeah or orange or whatever they were i just feel like you know we know what that is the image has to be different that's the first thing so and that's easy to do just put some different picture there anyway so that's one what's the second question <laughs> All right, so second and last question. Oh, actually, there might be a question after this. But anyway, a second question. What is something that you think needs to live in our industry? Something that's fundamental to our DNA that we should never forget? I've got a fluffy answer for that to start with and then, and, and then, and then a, a real one. So I think geologists are amongst the most passionate people out there. They love it. That is a, uh, a gift and also a curse. And, and so the gift is that we, we are super passionate about it. So we should be, and, and the curse is, when we find our, um, our, our, some of our peers who disagree with us, we get to 
engage with that disagreement and and we forget why we love geology. So I, I would love to keep that passion about our discipline and the celebratory part of it. And we could kind of park our differences, I think. We kind of should be on the same page. And if we disagree, with them, let's keep it private, not public. That's all right. That's all right. Okay, uh, here's another question. Do you remember that probably 10 or 14 years ago, you got a call from the Australian Immigration Department regarding a honor student. I just want to know, what did you say on that call? Uh, that was you, wasn't it? I don't remember. I can't remember. I, can, I can't remember the call. I remember, I can, but I will tell you, I remember going out into the field with you and a guy called Robin Armand mm-hmm. during your honors years. We only took one CD with one song on it. <laughs> and we had to listen to that one song for... Two weeks. Yep. Anyway, it was a song about a thylacine by <laughs> That's an right. artist called Nick Barker. It's hilarious. Robert and I were laughing about that today. So, yeah, and I remember playing lots of ping pong with you in your lab, in your room when I was an academic. So That's right. It's not doing any academic work. <laughs> but, yeah, neither were you, so we were probably pretty good company for each other. No, that's right. Yeah, that's right, exactly. No, thanks a lot, Pete. This is great. This has been excellent. It's been fun. Thank you. Cheers. This episode of Expression Radio was brought to you by Ahmad Salim and Steve Beresford. Produced by Sean Jeffrey, edited by Hamayu Mir, and recorded remotely in July 2021. This episode was sponsored by the One to One Group and The Asset. Find out more about them on our website, expressionradio.com. If you like this podcast, then consider becoming a sponsor to help us continue producing more of this content. You can email us on info at expirationradio.com to find out more about us. You can also reach out to us on LinkedIn, Twitter, or Instagram. Until next time, let's keep exploring.